if uh, acid deposition was a harbinger for VMC, mercury certainly followed uh, close behind. And Jamie's been a cooperator of VMC for many years and look forward to his talk on mercury. Thanks, Steve. And, and uh, yeah, I'll just give Jim's talk again. <laughs> Uh, yeah, like acid rain, uh, mercury is an atmospheric pollutant, as this uh, <clears throat> plot shows. This is uh, from an ice core in the Wind Rivers, and uh, it shows the kind of trend in mercury over the last couple hundred years. Um, we see that the baseline's not zero. There are, let me try to find the pointer here. There are um, natural sources of mercury, like volcanic eruptions. Uh, California gold rush, I guess that's not natural, but so this is downwind from that. So they use mercury in gold mining, but gradual ramp up from industrial activity and then a, a signs of a decline recently. So, um, but currently the, the mercury deposition is about, considered to be about three times uh, the natural background. Oh, I went too far. No, I didn't. Oh, okay. So, um, we're going to talk a little bit about um, mercury, uh, atmospheric mercury, stream mercury, and uh, kind of biological effects. Now, the first and last of those, the atmospheric and, and biological, the VMC has played a very active role. The streams, not so much, but that's my forte. So with Jim Duncan's uh, tacit approval, I, I'm going to present some data from a few other places on the, on the stream work to give you a full picture. Um, but just wanted to touch on the, the problem that mercury uh, causes in the environment. It is a neurotoxin. Uh, some of the pathways to, to humans, uh, one of the main pathways here is fish consumption. Um, walleye, for one, is, is really too high for children to be consuming it. Uh, but I did want to also mention artisanal gold mining, and this really is a, a killer more in the, in the global context because in, in third world countries it's used a lot uh, to try to, to get gold from the ore. They actually cook it over a fire and mix it with mercury, and they're inhaling uh, elemental mercury, and it's just incredibly harmful. And they don't know it, so well, there's an education component that needs to be done. Um, and then uh, there's a threat to wildlife. So um, both through the terrestrial and aquatic pathways, humans are more affected by the aquatic. Um, but m mercury really is not harmful to biota unless it's methylated, with the exception of that artisanal gold mining and inhaling vapor. But uh, <clears throat> otherwise, to get into the food web, it has to be uh, in an organic form. It has to be methylated. And this is done usually in anoxic environments like wetlands by um, sulfate or iron reducing bacteria. It's, it's uh, microbially mediated. So to jump into the atmospheric work, uh, Eric Miller um, with Mim Pendleton's great help at the Proctor Maple Research Center has done a lot of great work with mercury. Uh, Eric was a <clears throat> A frequent attendee at these meetings earlier on. Um, and this plot just shows kind of a, one of the, um, one of his uh, studies on, on where our mercury is coming from. And so on this plot, this shows the mercury concentration in the atmosphere and the, the colors represent pathways of where the air is coming from. So you see in the blue and the green, this is the blue, this is the green. When the air is coming from clean areas. We don't see mercury in the air, but when it's passing over these, the industrial area of the, of the Midwest, then we get these high concentrations. Um, and one thing that Eric liked to point out is that the mercury really uh, is, was fairly constant at Proctor for, for quite a long time. And he attributed that to um, the fact that we're so rural that we're not uh, close enough to these big sources so that when they do shut them down, we don't really see the effects and that our atmosphere, atmospheric mercury is coming from more global sources. And if you look at kind of the breakdown of global emissions, um, North America is actually quite small compared to some of the other sources, especially Asia. 
And Mercury has a residence time of about one year in the atmosphere, so um, it becomes globally mixed. So we're really affected everywhere by Mercury emitted everywhere. Um, so to get into the more terrestrial side, I wanted to talk a little bit. VMC has been doing a lot uh, of mercury monitoring. Thanks to Sandy Wilmot's initiative and this 200-year soil study, she said, hey, let's, uh, let's save some for mercury analysis. And so we've got a couple of good data sets. Uh, Neil Kamen generously agreed to have his lab run them. And uh, one thing that jumped out was uh, this increase of mercury with elevation. Um, and this has uh, developed into a, a separate project with Syracuse University across the Northeast. Um, and Don Ross has a, a poster on VMC's uh, soil study and the mercury work, and um, here it is. Uh, but you can see it in more detail later. Um, so jumping into streams now, uh, there was one VMC study, an early study, where we did look at mercury in streams, and this was uh, Tim Sherbatskoy's initiative. He got me, I have to thank him for getting me into the mercury work, which uh, occupied much of my next decade of research. But at this small stream draining the west side of Mount Mansfield, we saw really high concentrations of mercury, especially at the higher flows and snow melt. And uh, I was, I'm kind of an old acid rain guy, so I liked getting out there during storms, and uh, this was really exciting to me. So I kept storm sampling, uh, and a lot of the work then moved into the Lake Champlain Basin. Uh, which has a mercury problem in its fish. And uh, I told Neil Kamen I would embarrass him today on that photo on the right. That's actually Missisquoi Bay when the water was so high it extended into the surrounding forest. So we were grabbing samples there. Um, so, and then we, we looked at all the tributaries. We were trying to do a mercury mass balance budget for the lake, so we looked at all the tributaries and um, here's, here's just the Winooski for one year, and again, all the, uh, the high mercury are at the highest flows, and a lot of it is methylated, the, the green dots. So the methyl mercury, that's the toxic part, a lot of that was, um, you know, you, you th people thought of wetlands and, and the lake sediments as a place where the methylation occurs, but a lot of it occurs in the uplands and is already in the methyl form when it gets into the streams. So the lake is already getting inputs of methyl mercury from the terrestrial landscape. So when we did our mass balance, um, as is commonly found, we had a lot more mercury coming in than we had going out. So the, these, the, oops, the left bars are um, you know, wet and dry deposition of mercury. The output, or the, the input of all those into the lake uh, was this, this bar here, the stream input. If I can push the right button. So of all this coming into the watershed, only this much is actually making it to the lake, and then only this much is going into the Richelieu River. So mercury, the point of this slide is that mercury has a long residence time on, on the terrestrial uh, side and in the lake sediments. So uh, it's going to be with us unfortunately, for a long time to come because it's released only slowly. And I wanted to make the analogy to phosphorus because a lot of people in this room deal with phosphorus on a daily basis. And mercury and phosphorus actually have very similar behaviors, um, even though the inputs are radically different, atmospheric deposition versus manure spreaders and, and such. But they're both mobilized at, at high flows off the landscape. They're primarily associated with particulates. Uh, recent research has shown maybe this is not so, so much true as we thought for phosphorus, but still, particulate load is high. And this legacy issue that the phosphorus on the landscape and the mercury on the landscape are going to be with us for, for quite a while, no matter what we do. But we can do some management if we limit the uh, you know, suspended sediment runoff into streams, which is something we can try to curtail, uh, that will help. And finally, I wanted to touch on, on the biological component with which uh, VMC has had some active involvement, uh, especially uh, in conjunction with the Vermont Center for Eco Studies, and Chris Rimmer and Steve Fascio. 
Um, the Bicknell's thrush work, very, very neat work where um, they're looking at the uh, Bicknell's thrush in its wintering ground uh, had pretty high mercury burden. And if you kind of model the decay, the known decay in the body burden, it kind of, when they get to Vermont, it's kind of right where it should be. When they first, shoot, they first get here, uh, they're eating a, a lot of high mercury uh, ground dwelling like beetles and spiders, so they're, <laughs> it picks back up, but then when the leaves come out, they start eating leaf eating insects, and then it starts to decline again. So this kind of fits with, uh, with their food source, and it really shows the, uh, that this mercury is entering the terrestrial food chain by, by this, this uptick there. So finally, um, some take-home messages. The mercury source, uh, some of it's regional, but we're really um, impacted by global sources. It's taken up by soil and vegetation and released very slowly over decades. Only a very small fraction of the mercury is methylated, but it's highly toxic. Um, it enters both the terrestrial and aquatic food webs. The terrestrial affects more uh, wildlife. Humans do not tend to eat high in the food chain on the terrestrial side, but they do on the aquatic, so fish consumption is a concern. And like phosphorus, unfortunately, the legacy mercury will persist. Thanks.